Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Construction Project Management Principles and to my YouTube channel, Everything About Construction. So today we're going to be looking at seven mistakes that contractors often make. And in this topic, it doesn't really matter whether you're a big contractor, a small contractor, a subcontractor, trade partner. I think they're very common mistakes, but big contractors maybe make them less often because they've managed to become big for a lot of reasons uh, if they've been successful over a period of time. But let's unpack this and discuss this. I'm a professor of construction management. I grew up in a family-run construction business. I've been a consultant for decades. And so I know a little bit about uh, the business side of things. Uh, my background is in business degrees and MBAs. So I have sort of that perspective to bring to it, as well as the hands-on in the trenches, having done several trades myself. Uh, so I kind of can take a look at it from different viewpoints, plus the thousands and thousands of people that I've trained over the decades who many have started businesses and given me feedback and their own experiences over the past few decades. So let's get started. All right, so I've made this list and you know what, I could, I can do a number of videos on this topic, but this is a good starting point. And again, if, if you're new to my channel, check my playlists. Uh, if you're into construction business management, I've got a whole playlist on that topic, which is pretty much a course, as well as a number of videos, project management videos that tie to these topics as well. So what do we got starting off? Not charging enough, we'll get into that. Not choosing their clients carefully not tracking costs effectively, not finishing fast enough, not dealing with change orders correctly, and not managing cash flow. And then the last one kind of ties a bunch of them together, not managing growth effectively. So let's see what we can come up with as far as the issues and maybe some possible things that you could stick handle yourself to avoid if you're starting a business or if you're in a business and you're having some issues. Um, we'll talk about that. And, you know, if you have questions, put them in the comments uh, and I'll see if I have enough time. I will try to answer some of them. So not charging enough. Well, I think one of the issues is that people often don't know their value and understand their costs, meaning what's the burden rate per hour? You know, sometimes you're new to starting a business and you really don't fully comprehend what's your value and what your costs are. Uh, if you have employees, you know, you have to pay their direct costs, their hourly rate, but you also have to pay vacation pay. You have to pay your government sort of requirements. So in Canada, it's Canada pension plan and plan. In the States, it might be other things such as social security. You might have various deductions that you have to make. We have employment insurance here. We have workers compensation. Uh, we have a bunch of deductions that come off, which means that you have to basically add them on because you're going to be having to pay them. And so you want to make sure those are cover, covered as a base point. Then you have to make sure that you're putting enough on top to cover your overhead, the office. I don't care if you're working at home, you're still incurring costs. If you've got an office that you're renting, those are costs. And basically the bulk of your work has to have enough onto that, added to that, that covers your overhead, that's your phones, that's your vehicles, that's estimating projects that you never will get. Um, all of these things have to be paid for by the projects that you do get. And so that's important is that, have you got enough there for overhead? Profit, well, what is the target profit amount that you want to get? And some of that, you know, I can unpack this and I, I get into that in some of my other videos. Uh, but, you know, what kind of risk levels? Is this a cost plus? Is this a design bid build? Uh, you know, what kind of uh, risks are you taking? And that sort of will have uh, an impact on basically your expected profit levels because it's this risk return aspect. You take more risk, you should expect more return for taking those risks. In construction, you know, we're probably looking at somewhere between 4% and 15% that we're targeting for profit. And 15 is very high. 
If you can get that, that's great. Uh, 4% might be where you're got, don't, not taking a lot of risk uh, on a particular contract. And have you allowed for contingencies? The planning fallacy, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote an excellent book called Thinking Fast and Slow, um, coined this the planning fallacy. And basically, we take an overly optimistic view of what things will take. So if we're taking on a lot of risk, we tend to think that things will go better than we expect. You know, I took this uh, house that's being gutted and it's been underpinned and lowered the basement. And they've been working like a long time on this particular house. And there's a lot of costs that's involved in that. And did they actually take into account all those costs uh, when they actually bid on it? You know, so there's risks involved, especially on design bid build contracts. How are you covering that? So, um, really, you need to know how income statements work. I know you're a construction person, but you know, income statement, basically you got to know how they work so that you make sure that you're covering your costs, that basically the projects that you're doing in a year cover your costs. Otherwise, you know, you find out your truck is basically you're wearing it out. And if you're a small business in a few years, all of a sudden you decide you find you have to buy another truck. Well, where's that money coming from? Are you digging yourself digger deeper and deeper? You should be making a profit. You should be covering your overhead if you're going to be in business for yourself, right? So really understand the value you provide. In construction, we have a lot of value that we provide. And in most jurisdictions, you know, in most jurisdictions in North America, in UK, in Australia, you know, there's a shortage of skilled workers. I don't know about your jurisdiction, but I know in basically urban settings in many of these areas that my viewers are coming from, there's a big shortage. And so when there's a shortage, supply and demand, you should be able to get the value that you think for your projects. You shouldn't underestimate yourself. So not charging enough, that's a big one. Not choosing your clients seriously. Well, this is the other thing. You don't want to work with everyone. Repeat after me. You don't want to work with everyone. There are some clients, they are going to stress you out and you do not want to work for them. So if you can figure those ones out ahead of time, that is helpful. The term is qualifying the client. You know, number one, you only have so many hours in the day. If you're a smaller contracting business, you've got to pick and choose who you're going to take the time to quote. And you want to look at probabilities. Who are you going to be able to most likely convert into paying clients? It doesn't matter if you're a small company or a big company. A big company still has a limited amount of time and they've got a certain area where they are have strengths and that's where you want to hone in on focusing getting those particular types of projects for you if you're a smaller contractor you want to make sure you don't get the client from hell you want to have somebody that's going to pay you in a timely fashion respect the work that you do be somebody that you can converse with easily that is not going to be some sort of perfectionist that you will never be able to satisfy. These are some of the hallmarks of things that you want to try to pick up on. I remember one time I showed a client, prospective client, uh, a house that uh, we had finished and it was about the best I could do as far as quality. It was very, very, very nice. And I remember um, the clients, the, the husband, getting down on his hands and knees and there was this tiny, tiny camera mark on the baseboard behind uh, one of the doors and he was like tripping out over it. And I thought, I do not want to work with this person. And so I just basically made the price so high that there was no way that I would ever get it. And I talked to the consultant, the architect later on and they, I said, how's that project going? And she said, it's in litigation because it was a very difficult client. So I was lucky on that one, but I've had ones where I've missed it and they're smarter than me and they figured out they can be really nice in the bidding process and then later it's problematic. You can't always win on all of them, but the more that you're able to weed out that way, the better it'll be for your business because it drains your energy, it drains your focus. And so you definitely want to make sure that you do that. And fortunately, you know what? In truth, they are a small amount of the overall clients. But at the same time, if there's somebody that ends up not paying you at the end, they could bankrupt you potentially. So this is a mistake that contractors make. Not tracking costs effectively. 
So you need to know where you're losing money and where you're making money. And big construction companies are much, much better at this. They're much better at this. Smaller to mid-sized, they're not quite as good because their systems might not be up to par uh, or they're too busy, as Michael Gerber would say in his great book, um, basically, um, would say, they tend to spend too much time working in the business and not on the business. This is definitely an on the business topic, right? And so for that particular area, we definitely wanna have a baseline budget and a baseline schedule. And the baseline budget, we wanna check. We wanna see what is our baseline and what is our variance. We can see it on variable costs. We can see it on things like fixed costs. And we'd wanna know why, what's going on. And that's good feedback. And if we can get feedback as close to as the work is happening, the better, because then we can do something about it within the projects, perhaps. But it's excellent feedback. Otherwise, we really don't know where that money is going. Um, I remember my dad, when I was uh, a kid, he always had sort of an in intuition of where we lost money on projects. But later on, when we really track them, it's true on those things you did, but sometimes there's these other areas that they're just robbing you, but you don't really know because it's smaller amount. It's not something that jumps out at you. And if it's something that's kind of taking away from your profit margins and it's just sort of leaking it away, it may be something that you can easily fix. And then that will save you in all the years and projects going forward. So that's, that's what you really want to be able to do, cost control. I have a playlist that you could check on cost control that dives into that much more deeply. Um, not finishing fast enough. So time and money, right? Time and money. Time is money. And there's no, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but definitely it is. And sometimes we get distracted too. Uh, especially, you know, small to mid-size. You see projects where they're kind of working on it and then it just sits there. And then they come back and they're working on it and then it just sits there. Well, the problem is that's a lot that you're not completing the projects. You're not running them through to completion. There's probably holdback monies that's sitting there that basically is affecting, as we'll talk later, on cash flow. So you want to definitely get in and get out. You want to do your quality of work. You want to think, and this is a lean terminology that I use a lot, that is lean, is you want to have good flow in your project. <laughs> we don't have to work harder or faster in construction, what we really have to do is have good flow to our work. And that will make a big difference in our profitability and our schedules. Not dealing with change orders correctly. This is always a sore point with clients. So you gotta get good at it, right? Gotta get good at it. You gotta improve your sales and negotiation skills because clients always think you're making a fortune with change orders. And that probably, in some cases, in a lot of cases, people undervalue, contractors undervalue the amount of money a change order costs. They even think often, I'm charging a lot for this, I'm okay with this. But when they consider the interruption to work, uh, the ripple effect that it causes on their project, very often, even though they think they're high on the change orders, they're not even covering enough and then they don't sell it well, well enough and then they're into this battle with clients. There's different types of change orders. There's change orders that add a lot of value to the clients and there's change orders that clients aren't going to be happy with because maybe it's a design error that their consultant, their architect made and then you know it's going to cost all this extra money. They thought they were getting that with the original price and now they're not. You can see how that's going to be like really wearing on them. Something that adds a lot of value, usually those are a little bit easier to sell, but at the same time, you gotta make sure that it's not interrupting your flow of work so much that you haven't accounted for it. So making sure, sometimes it's totally separate and it's not a big deal. Other times it's like these little changes here, there and everywhere and it keeps sort of causing friction in your ability to run the project successfully. So not dealing with change orders correctly, that's one that is an issue. And also making sure that you get things signed properly, filled out properly, so that basically it becomes part of the contract amount and then you're collecting on the work as you go, as your progress billing, billings are going. Do not leave it till the end and then put it on to the client. Oh yeah, and we have this 21,000. Remember we said this and you agreed to that and you agreed to this and you agreed. 
they don't know what the total amounts adding up to they're not keeping track of that you have to keep track of that and you have to say this is the previous contract amount this is the extra and this is the revised contract amount so you have to make sure those things are dealt with whether it's a simple form like this or whether it's like a more um, sophisticated form like we have in ccdc uh, canadian construction documents committee or basically some of the u.s documents basically you have to make sure that that's followed not managing cash flow well it is difficult in construction it is difficult because there's very often holdback amounts uh, for lien legislation you know 10% uh, holdback very frequently uh, to an, and that's a legal requirement in most of Canada it's in the US in a lot of states so you have to make sure that you've got the holdback amounts for the appropriate um, basically the client's going to hold that back so that means right away 10% on your cash flow is impacted now you can hold back from subcontractors because that can be part and parcel of the process but you can't hold back from all the vendors and different things like that so uh, it's hard it's hard and I know you know I, I know uh, some contractors that have gone bankrupt where basically that holdback amount all of a sudden at the end the client decides they're not going to pay it and then it's going to go to court and then it's going to take years and years in court and the contractor can't afford it and meantime they go into bankruptcy it can get very very messy you definitely want to be proactive on your cash flow and this goes back to what i said tracking your costs tracking your time and then cash flow is not a big deal to track um, and you can predict you can look out for it if you you could have very profitable projects and if you can't pay your subs and if you can't pay your employees and your vendors you're done even though you've got profitable projects if you have a cash flow issue that you didn't expect you're done so you have to look out forward you have to make sure you have enough liquidity line of credit cash in the bank that you can pay people as the projects come up so you can forecast outward and you can see the amount of money that's going out in a month and basically the cumulative amounts for a project so that's something to really look at carefully it's brought a lot of construction companies down um, not managing growth effectively so this will be the last one that i'll talk about and i love this quote by charlie munger he's warren buffett's he just recently passed um, but he's Warren Buffett's uh, partner and he has he has a lot of great quotes by the way um, if you ever get a chance read poor Charlie's almanac which is kind of his take on Benjamin Franklin's almanac he's got a lot of um, very good um, business cases in there so more companies die of indigestion than they do of starvation so what does he mean by that it means that it's, and he's talking about com companies in general it's more so even with construction companies because we always talk big bucks. Everything is expensive, right? And so if you take on way more than you can handle, then that's going to be very, very difficult to manage effectively. You're stretching yourself to the ends, right? And so it's like you're stuffing yourself. Uh, and a lot of people stuff themselves, right? A lot of companies expand themselves. Um, not that you can't die of starvation too that's a that's another side but definitely I think in this if I'm talking about mistakes this is a big one here where you take on too much and then Jim Collins in his great work um, the book good to great you can tell I read a lot of books uh, basically has this one Packard's law and that's after from Hewlett Packard um, basically no company can grow revenues consistently faster then its ability to get enough of the right people to implement that growth and still become a great company. So if you're expanding really quickly in construction and in a lot of markets, it's hard to get really good people. It's not like there's an abundance. It's not like there's a huge recession going on when you're expanding usually. Uh, it's tough to get the right people. And if you get the wrong people in construction, it, productivity rates really go down and that's our biggest variable in construction is productivity rates labor rates being able to get things done at the quality expectation you're after so Packard's law and then Jim Collins had another one get the right people on the bus the wrong people off the bus get the right people in the right seats 
positions, jobs, doing what they're best at, and then decide where to drive the bus. Use that knowledge to your advantage. Leverage that knowledge and grow at a steady pace. Don't way overextend yourself and leave yourself vulnerable. Live to fight another day. But that doesn't mean you can't grow. You can definitely grow. But you want to grow in a measure, measured fashion that will get you to where you need to go. And so that also, of course, when you're growing rapidly, cash flow management becomes even more important. And often people don't have the systems built in with that rapid growth. So that also causes them a lot of hiccups along the way. So those are the seven um, points that I wanted to make of mistakes that contractors typically make. If you enjoyed this video, let me know what you think. Put your comments in. Please click the likes and subscribe and let's help grow this construction community together. So I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.